When night falls in Las Vegas, Fremont Street lights up, awash in a canopy of 12.5 million LED lights and a 550,000 watt sound system. But there was a time when the flashes that lit the sky over the Nevada desert were anything but benign. For four months beginning in 1951, the U.S. military detonated atomic weapons 65 miles northwest of the Vegas Strip. Assured that they were a safe distance away from any fallout, tourists clamored to Sin City for Don bomb parties, downing atomic cocktails while waiting for the spectacle. It was the sheep of Iron County, Utah, who first showed the symptoms of radiation sickness. Before long, leukemia and other rare diseases were showing up in clusters in communities all over southern Utah. The downwinders, as they came to be known, were the unsuspecting victims of radioactive fallout. No one's sure of the full extent of the toll on human lives, but in 2000, the National Institutes of Health declared that 49,000 deaths could be directly linked to the testing. And the effects linger on. Downwinders in Nevada, Idaho, and Utah are still at greater risk for developing cancer. But today, there's someone looking out for them. Today we'll hear from Professor Richard Hammermesh and Kathy Giusti about their case entitled Intermountain Healthcare, Pursuing Precision Medicine. I'm your host, Brian Kenny, and you're listening to Cold Call. So we are all sitting there in the classroom. The professor walks in. And, and they look up and you know it's coming. Oh, the dreaded cold call. Richard Hammermesh is an expert on the business issues affecting healthcare policy and delivery. Kathy Juicy is a senior fellow at Harvard Business School and the founder of the Multiple Myeloma Research Foundation. Together they co-chair the Kraft Precision Medicine Accelerator. That's a lot of words there. Thank you both for joining me today. Pleasure to be here. Really interesting case about Intermountain Healthcare. I admit I read it twice because there's a lot of information there, but it's also so relevant and timely and compelling. And I do want to talk about what you're doing with precision medicine here at HPS because it ties directly back to the case. So we've got a lot of ground to cover. Richard, could you just start by telling us what led you to write this case? Well, as you mentioned, Kathy and I are co-chairs of the uh, HBS Craft Precision Medicine Accelerator whose origins were a $20 million endowment gift from the Kraft family to, quote, unquote, accelerate progress in precision medicine. And Kathy and I have been at this for three and a half years now. Part of what we do in typical HBS fashion is try to document best or leading practice. And in that regard, Kathy in particular, myself to a lesser degree, are at conferences all the time. And we've caught wind, so to speak, Mm -hmm. of Intermountain Precision Genomics and Lincoln Nadold, the light bulbs immediately went off that this could be a great case, that the challenges of actually delivering precision medicine, there are lots of challenges in developing precision drugs, and the accelerator works on that also, but delivering it were worthy of a case. And then just one other thing that we had a prior case on Intermountain Healthcare because they're so well known for their expertise at delivery and cost containment. But that case was about 15, 16 years old. So I always knew we could use an update. Mm -hmm. And thus, there is a third author, Rob Huckman, who's more of a healthcare delivery person. Kathy and I are more on the biotech drug development side. Why don't you just start us off by uh, setting the stage? How does the case begin? The Intermountain Precision Genomics effort started three years prior to the case. The case is set in early 17. So in one regard, it's a typical introduction. Lincoln Nadold, the director, is assessing, you know, the progress they've made and how it's gone, which sets up the questions in class. You know, how have they done? Why did they do this? Have they met their objectives? At the same time, They've been so successful, in my mind, that some of their original initiatives have now taken on a a life of their own. So Lincoln is wondering, or Dr. Nadold, really, to be more respectful, is wondering what's the next thing to do. And he's considering two alternatives. One, to try to figure out if there's some genomic test that would indicate for uh, people who have depressive syndrome, which of the SSRIs would be most appropriate for them. And then he's also sitting on a tissue bank of 10 million samples, Mm. and he's wondering if they sequence those samples, would you be able to glean some insights? Yeah, what are the possibilities? So it's both the big picture, you know, what next, and then two specifics, very typical of a case. Kathy, can you tell us about Intermountain Healthcare? What's their story? What's the big picture there? 
I think the beauty of this case, and Richard alluded to this, is Lincoln comes in, and he is somebody who cares deeply about precision medicine, but he led the way in precision medicine in oncology. And technically, that was a great place for Intermountain to start, to say, we care about oncology, we care about sequencing the genomes of cancer patients, and I'm going to start where the highest unmet need is, which is the stage four patients that desperately need to get their genomes sequenced. I think the fact that he was able to get Intermountain really started around precision medicine medicine around oncology made so much sense Mm -hmm. because then you could move either to other diseases as well in the precision medicine space. But go back for a minute. Where is Intermountain located? So it's located in the Utah area and just high caliber people. And as you know, from what you already started with in the beginning, a high prevalence of cancer issues. And the issue they were facing early on was they were not the most well-respected place to come in the community for cancer care. And so for Lincoln, moving that over to the precision medicine space was truly helpful. It helped to set Intermountain apart right from the beginning. But Lincoln was coming from Stanford. So I guess my, que- yeah. my question really is, how did Intermountain Healthcare convince Lincoln to come from Palo Alto, California to a pretty rural part of Utah. Well, as you saw in the case, it took him a year of discussions to actually get (laughs) to that point. And they actually talked about having all the legal quagmires that went into that. But I think the beauty of it was they were allowing Lincoln to have a research space. Mm. So, you know, when you come in from Stanford and you've come in from the academic space, you still want to believe that you're doing your research. But I think you also tie that back to the culture of Intermountain, which was we are about excellence in clinical care. Yes, we want the research to be getting done, but we take great pride in making sure that the clinical outcomes are as strong as they possibly can be. What Lincoln is passionate about is sharing data in those community centers with a twofold approach. One is identify new targets where you can, but second is optimize the care pathways that every patient should be on. Mm-hmm. That is the best thing for a patient to hear. Richard, you had a point? Two things. One, uh, Intermountain is known for developing patient care pathways Mm -hmm. that result in better outcomes and lower costs. The other thing is, in the case uh, reviews this, there was a very personal story that Lincoln went through when he was at Stanford of a 39-year-old mother of two with advanced stomach cancer, stomach cancer still being not a diagnosis you want to hear. And uh, he tried to get her targeted therapies. And of course, this was a number of years ago, and you would need to get compassionate use or off-label use. By the time they finished getting through all the regulatory hurdles at Stanford and NCI and so on, the patient passed away the day before. Mm -hmm. And I think that left Lincoln with, yes, he can do all this great research at Stanford, but he also wants to be at a place where he can have an impact on patients, you know, who are very sick, who he knows there's a drug that may work. And Intermountain is so dedicated to patient care and pathways. But remember, too, I think what's interesting in tying it back to Kraft, Mm -hmm. that was the same story that you heard with Robert Kraft and why he started the Precision Medicine Accelerator was the same thing happened. You know, his wife gets diagnosed with ovarian cancer. They can't find a drug for her fast enough either. And I think the focus becomes twofold. One is, should we be sequencing patients earlier so you're not frantically trying to find out what their genome is? So that's one element of Precision Medicine. And the second is, how do you accelerate the drug development so that you identify the target and you get a multitude of new drugs to that space? Yeah. Let me just ask you at this point, because it's a good good time to bring it up. For people who are listening who don't know what precision medicine is, can you just put a definition on it? We always define it as getting the right patient the right drug at the right time. And when you look at it in the field of oncology, it's so important for every patient to understand that just because you've been diagnosed with one form of cancer, like for myself, multiple myeloma, it doesn't mean that my myeloma looks like everybody else's. There's Mm -hmm. 10 different forms of myeloma that we know of. And each of those will end up being treated slightly differently. So as a patient, you need to know your subtype, your specific genome as much as you possibly can, because it will affect your treatment, your care pathway, as Lincoln would say. But secondly, is the more you share that data, the faster we can identify a target and attract pharmaceutical companies and biotechs to the field to give us the new drugs we need to help cure you. Mm -hmm. So that data piece
piece becomes really important in precision medicine. Right, right. So let's go back to Intermountain for a second. They've got a history of innovation. You mentioned that we would written cases about them as much as right. 10 or 15 years ago. This case outlines some of the real innovations that they've come up with, not even directly related to precision medicine. These were all the precursors to Dr. Brent James led this effort, and it really is applying Toyota management, Edward Deming principles to healthcare delivery. And what does that mean? Reduce variation yeah. and develop several paths that everyone would follow. And the results have been really quite spectacular. Uh, the, and some of these are uh, outlined for acute respiratory distress syndrome. Mm-hmm. By just standardizing the treatment, what order you give antibiotics, how many you give, their survival rates went from 9.5 percent, I mean, this is a tough syndrome, to 44 percent. Wow. That's a huge deal. And then an, another one, just by having better and more specific criteria for preemies of who gets into an incubator or not. hmm They increased survival and cut costs dramatically. And the answer was, as often happens in medicine, less is more. You know, getting if you can get the right therapy, you don't need as much. And let me just note one other thing on this one. That costs Intermountain money because in our fee-for-service system, if you have a preemie in a respirator, you get reimbursed handsomely, Mm -hmm. not Mm -hmm. nearly what you get if they're just getting IV antibiotics and not in the respirator. But for them, their mission is the best treatment at the lowest cost, but starting with the best treatment. So, Kathy, clearly Dr. Nadel is in a place that's open to innovation, it sounds like, and they're willing to do things differently. Precision medicine has a set of obstacles that come along with it. Can you talk a little bit about what those obstacles are in terms of advancing this notion in the medical community? So the biggest obstacle is that in precision medicine, the joy was that genomic sequencing started to happen and it started to become somewhat affordable. But the question becomes, who pays for it? Mm -hmm. So that's obstacle number one. The patient doesn't know to ask for it. And then even if you do need to get it done, you're not sure who will be willing to pay for it. It's hard to get every patient sequenced at that point in time. The second piece is just because you have a certain data set of patients who have been sequenced, the better information you have, which is great genomic data, but longitudinal, that becomes really important. And you need to compare and contrast as many data sets as you possibly can. So trying to get an abundance of a critical mass of data also becomes a problem. Mm -hmm. So patient awareness, reimbursement of the testing, and then the ability to share data sets are the great obstacles on the precision medicine side. Are there things that you are looking at in the Craft Precision Accelerator to address some of those things? Every which way. So in the accelerator, what we do on the patient side is we work with five cancers today to say, what is the awareness that all five cancers, breast, prostate, pancreatic, lung, myeloma, have on precision medicine? What's their understanding of genomic testing? And surprisingly, less than half of patients knew precision medicine, and only 20% really fully understood what genomic testing was all about. So mm-hmm. with Kraft, we're educating everybody on the patient side, and we're doing it in a collaborative way. On the data side, then what we do is we actually tell everybody, because we've actually researched it, where is the oncology data? Who are the machine learning companies, and how do we combine data sets? So we're actually doing that kind of work. And then how do we drive it to the clinic to have better clinical outcomes for the targets that we identify and then move that to new investment models. So everything we do moves in a cycle at the Craft Accelerator, starting with the patient, helping them to understand the role of their data, moving that data to the clinic, and then making sure the venture firms understand with the most innovative models, how do you commercialize it faster, addressing exactly what Lincoln and Robert Kraft were looking for. We need to get these drugs in the hands of the patients as fast as we can. And what I thought was interesting about Lincoln, too, was one of the people he was uh, was kind of his mentor, and he always talks about all the time, is Clay Christensen up here at HBS. And so, um, you know, when he was talking about this whole idea, you know, he was reaching out to you know the advisory group and Clay was on there and you know as you say in the case he stood up and said this is innovation and let's allow um, Lincoln to do this and I think when you have leadership like that within your organization that helps you too yeah if I could just add Clay is on the board of Intermountain and has been very supportive of this but just what Kathy mentioned on data and, and back on on the case Intermountain has a great information system 
But as Kathy said, it's still limited. No one, particularly on the less common cancers, no one has enough data. And this is a great example, and it's it, it's in the case. He realized that they were seeing cases that he didn't have a large enough data set to really be able to help the patient. Mm-hmm. What does he do? He starts something called the open network. Yeah, I was going to ask about that. Tell me more about that. Well, uh, and I would have to look up exactly. It's very clever, open, you know. But yeah. he he was able to get Stanford Medical System and Providence Health Systems to combine their data sets. Uh, So that when he would have a patient of a certain sort, a certain subtype, a certain age, a certain sex, and he says, I need to see 12 patients like this, and he may have only three. Well, you know, 12 isn't great, but I'll tell you, it's a lot better than three. And, you know, and more and more with precision medicine, sort of almost every cancer is becoming, you know, a, a small subset. Here's an example of someone who could rest on his laurels at uh, at Intermountain, but instead he's thinking bigger picture. How do we get even more data? One of the things I was thinking about as I read the case was he's behaving like more than just a doctor here. He's thinking holistically about the whole process from beginning to end, which really gets into some serious management issues. You know, we talk about information that's living in different places and how do you pull that together. He's thinking about business models. I mean, I don't know if you've talked to him about that, Kathy. Oh, yeah. He's just an amazing man in terms of his leadership skills. So when you get to know him, I think it's the passion of the patient, as we saw, because this patient really registered with him that had gastric cancer. But it's also the fact that he he's business savvy, and mm-hmm. he and it just comes naturally to him when you meet him. And third is he's an amazing network. Somehow along the way, when you see where he's reaching out to these other health systems, and yes, it was fortunate because they were all under the same platform, that helped him tremendously. But he's reaching out to people that know him and trust him and know he's going to get things done. And I think that's the leadership that allowed a lot of good people to come to Inter- mountain and I think it's how he built the network around him. Mm-hmm. Even when you see Lincoln at a medical meeting and he's speaking, people go to his panels because he has something important to say and we tend to follow and want to work with him because we know he will get things done. Yeah. What were some of the things that they did to operationalize this at Great. Intermountain? Well, there were th- there are three pieces of it. The first is you get sequenced. Now, initially it was stage 4 cancer patients, very sick people. They developed their own platform for this, and in typical Intermountain fashion, can turn it around very fast. Time is of the essence here, right? Second, okay, now you have the genomic information. What do you do with it? And like with a lot of things, medical and particularly when you're that sick, there can be a difference of opinion Mm -hmm. what to Mm -hmm. do. He formed what was called the Molecular Tumor Board, both people in-house and people, again, to Kathy's point about the network that he built, who would talk on the phone after hours. Let's all review this case. Here's what the sequencing says. That was two. And third, a drug procurement team. So a team of people who live night and day to deal with all the insurance companies and get off-label use, get compassionate use. And as the case chronicles, of course, at the beginning, it took long and was arduous. But by the time the case is, they've been doing this for three years, which yeah. is the issue in the case, 95% of the cases they can sail through right away because mm-hmm. they've been there, done that, you know, a typical uh, ex- experience curve type well, of And they're thing. gathering more data as they go. Exactly. And, yeah, and yeah. the survival of these patients as a result of being on these targeted therapies increased just about twofold. Wow. Now, there are was a a downside. This is always the downside. The longer you live, the more costs you're going to Mm -hmm. incur. The weekly expense they would incur went down. But you double their lifetime. Of course, the total cost goes up. It's sort of a red herring issue when you teach the case because in the end, this is the whole purpose is to extend life and we'll figure out how to pay for these things. It, I, I'm yeah. not trying to minimize not the a trivia, problem. I was going to say it's not a trivial question, though, because we've, we know we've got a healthcare payer system that's very complicated to navigate, that, that is very fickle about what they will and won't cover. So how are they grappling with that issue? So he's looking at late-stage patients who, at that point, they need to be sequenced if you're going to find last resort drugs for them. But the truth is, this is a positive for FDA. FDA doesn't get upset about this. You're also starting to give us anecdotal information about 
about what those targets are. And even though the drug might be a lung cancer drug, and this is in the case study too, you may find new targets for other cancers. So it's a very informative data set that he's playing back to you. I think the joy of it is once you start to get that anecdotal information, it gives the drug companies and the patients an understanding of where else these drugs might work, and then they can get you know additional indications on the label. And that can be incredibly powerful. I think the business model then for Intermountain was, yes, you're getting the late stage patients. Yes, it's costly to take care of them, but you're establishing yourself as a very strong cancer center, and you're starting to bring in a lot of the other cancer patients that are going to be much earlier stage that you can have a greater impact on. And so I think the the business model made a tremendous amount of sense, and I think it was incredibly thoughtful for all of the patients as well. I think the fact that he ended up also combining data sets with other health systems became really powerful because he did understand the the larger I make this database, the better off we're all going to be over time. Mm-hmm. And I think that helped everybody too. Mm-hmm. You know, it's interesting. Uh, we developed this case. We run an executive education course called Accelerating Innovation and in Precision Medicine. Yeah. We had over 70 people here last September. And this was our capstone case, our last case. Uh, uh, Lincoln was there. And one of the things he pointed out on this issue as they have developed this reputation, donors start stepping forward yeah. Yeah. Uh, to you know have their name on part of the pavilion and uh, and so on. And at the time when this all started, as Kathy said, people from Southwest Utah were going outside the system. They are now a net importer of patients. Wow, is the reputation? I don't think in healthcare that you can start with a financial motivation. I, you know, I'm enough of, of, of a cheery-eyed person that I think if you do the right thing, the, the it, it ends up paying off, uh, and maybe not even in the real long run, you know, pretty yeah. soon. Well, I think, you know, everybody's been touched by cancer. I don't think there's anybody who hasn't been touched by it directly in right. some ways. So that stands to reason. This is for either of you. Do you see Intermountain as a scalable? Th- is this something that could be replicated and scaled in other places? Absolutely. I mean, it takes the leadership of a Lincoln and the team that he brought in to do it, but absolutely scalable. Mm-hmm. And you just need the right kind of health system. We, you know, we see them in the craft, Geisinger and Kaiser. Everybody has big data sets. And the more they start to work on this, the better off we're all going to be. Most of cancer care is happening at the community level. Mm-hmm. You know, 75%, they often say, is happening out at the community. So the more we can work with them, the better off we'll be. I think the joy of what an Intermountain does is they're always looking at the analytics. And one of the things that Lincoln talks about, because another part of what Intermountain does well is the education side. So what he has often said is, if you come up looking at the data with the best care pathway, he still wants to make sure that that data, that medical education is shared fully with every clinician at Intermountain. So, you know, he likes to work with even patient advocacy groups to say, how do I communicate this and get the best myeloma doctor to talk about how this care pathway works? And then they can even watch to see if they execute the care pathway, what is it the, what are the outcomes that they're mm-hmm. changing? And so because they have this amazing closed system, everybody wants to work with them. But they're not the only system out there that does that. So I think they're setting the tone. And I think there's a number of health systems that can actually do this. And it's great. It's a good thing for patients. Yeah. And one of the things we're trying to do with the Craft Accelerator is we want this disseminated broadly, thus the case study. But there's another executive education course here at, at the school, Managing Healthcare Delivery, that are just hospital folks. This case is taught there. Those are the people who can really implement it. To me, it's a great example of a topical HBS case that can help reach multiple audiences and hopefully have a real impact. Do you get a sense from these class discussions that you're having how people who are in the healthcare system will adapt to something like this? Are they going to eventually hit a, a wall where the system is not ready to accept it? I think great leaders, that's what they do, is they figure out either how to bust through or go around. It's kind of interesting this started in a small part of, of Intermountain. A lot of innovation starts not in the center, but where you have more degrees of freedom. So there are lots of leadership lessons. And more and more, I mean, you are seeing a focus on developing care pathways. 
and he's a real pioneer. Yeah. But I think you look at first movers to second movers, and I think that's what craft actually does well. Within each of those work streams, we can definitely see who's a first mover that's doing the absolute best work in direct-to-patient or data and analytics. And then what you try to do is put them very close together with who could be the second or third mover. And that way you start to move the system much faster. Yeah. And I think that's a really good way to go because leaders want to work with other leaders. Just going back to craft for a second, how are you feeling about the progress you've made? I feel like we've made tremendous progress. I also think Richard and I laugh about this, that we're solving a problem that nobody knows is out there. Yeah. And we're doing it well, which is surprisingly is, you know, over the years, I gave academic centers a hard time for not sharing their data. But the truth is, cancers don't talk to each other. And it's not that we're bad people. It's just that there's no easy vehicle by which to bring us together. So one of the interesting things about the Craft Initiative is we literally are bringing all the cancers together to talk, to share best practices, to share their data, to share information that they would never have shared before. Mm -hmm. And I think they're solving a lot of problems much faster than ever before. I think we feel much better that at least finally now, myeloma, pancreatic, glioblastoma, breast, prostate are actually learning so much from each other and speeding things along. I feel like we've made tremendous progress there. I think the other thing that we've identified is a lot of people don't know the real problems behind precision medicine. We've been doing it with them for the, from the genomic standpoint. But in all honesty, this is not just an oncology issue. And we talk about this a lot, too. This is an Alzheimer's issue. It's a neurology issue. So the more we keep disseminating our information and people keep reading about it, I think we'll start bringing a lot of groups together, which will be really powerful. That's really exciting. Thank you both for joining me today. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you, Brad. If you enjoy Cold Call, you should check out HBS Skydeck, a podcast series that features interviews with HBS alumni from across the world of business, sharing lessons they've learned and their own life experiences. Thanks again for listening. I'm your host, Brian Kenny, and you've been listening to Cold Call, an official podcast of Harvard Business School.